if somebody's going to be a really strong salesperson, like what are you looking for? What are the what are the traits that you're looking for? First 50 days are critical. Salespeople are good at selling you to hire them and then doing nothing. So you got to put them on the short leash, 30 days, 60 days. If they don't to produce, buy. It's real simple. Okay. Don't be all touchy feely. Well, I think you're going to turn the corner this month. No, you were supposed to get five homes, 10 homes, one home. You fail. Sales is so easy because it's nothing but KPIs. There's nothing but numbers. You put the numbers on the scoreboard or you don't. Right. Excuses don't matter in sales. If they don't make it happen, move on and get the next one because the sales people hire them. Yeah. Fire fast, hire fast is the way I like to think about it. Right. So, or hire fast, hire fast. And especially in sales, that whole mentality of like, numbers do matter most, I think can offend the wrong people that shouldn't be in a sales role. But if you truly are a salesperson, then the numbers are all that matter to you. Like all you're looking at is leaderboard, the scoreboard. Like all I'm looking at is like the 45 doors that I closed, you know, that month. So that Matthew you can give me shit about the 50 I didn't close the next month, you know? So <laughs> just uh, trying to like outpace myself, you know, as much as possible. And the same thing with our internal reps too, right? Yeah, I'd be curious how y'all think about, like, when you think about hiring a salesperson, like, what are expectations of uh, onboarding? Trey, maybe you should uh, start with this, and then I'd be curious about uh, Brad and Maya's comments, but just onboarding of the sales rep, like, what does that look like? How long does it take? How long should we wait to, for them to start selling? Brad's saying, like, five days. <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, you know brad saying 30 days i mean really or as as we ramped up and and grew and, and built a sales team it was you know it had to be very you know specific about expectations and what is that ramp up time you know one do we have are we giving them the tools and the resources they need to be successful um and if not then we need to internally ramp up our training and the resources that they have but you know really We've got a pretty defined ramp up period of, you know, zero to 30 days is this. After 30 days, you should be hitting X number of doors. And really by, you know, 90 days in or three months in, you should be fully ramped up and be, you know, closing the the same number of doors as the rest of the team. I've got a more condensed timeline because most of the operators watching this are going to be small or small-ish. Uh, they're not as corporate, so they don't have an outline of training. Give them. Four to five days, one week of business training, give them two shadowed presentations in person at home. And at that point, they should be able to be off and running on their own. I get a 30 to 60 day short leash from that point and making sales happen should be the norm. I mean, if they're not closing after that, there's something wrong. After a couple of presentations with good marketing materials, it's just kind of like answer some questions. Okay, let's go through our management agreement. That's not that hard to do. Let's go through basic questions. Here's what you charge for a manager fee. Here's how you do a lease agreement. Here's how you do an eviction. After that, I mean, you're just answering questions. Now, they got to be able to do the follow-ups. You, as a business owner, got to put leads in front of them. That's the number one thing a business owner has to do is put leads in front of them. If you're not doing that, a business development person can't close business. Well, I think that's the big, that's the big thing, too. Um, the industry that I came from, kind of branding and marketing world, Spencer mentioned I was in that in that realm for about 15 to 18 years. And I mean, it, every, everybody, you know, a lot of competition. And so it's one of those things where I tell the sales team, well, a lot of time it's not, you know, what we're selling is not, it's not that hard of a sale. And so really, if you're having those conversations and you're solving a pain that they're having, especially if they're self-managing, it should be a pretty easy sale if you are able to execute on the operational side. My thought is that the the biggest and clearest distinguishing pattern is that the people who close the most deals are being set the most deals. That's not a very satisfying answer, but that's the reality. When somebody rolls up and says, I'm closing 50 deals because you're being sent way more deals, you know? You could be closing 100 deals a month and basically just acting as a cashier. You're just taking the money. That is a lot less impressive than somebody that's going out and hunting. If I was going to press and, 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 and look to same set of circumstances, one guy, guy or gal is really outperforming the other, what's different? What comes to mind for me is that they're a domain expert. They really believe in the asset class. They really understand the conversation and are a peer 
and a guide to the person that they're talking to, as opposed to my my management company. How is my management company than the other? I mean, do your best, come up with some stuff. But at the end of the day, you know what you can be different is knowing dramatically more about being a real estate investor than the BDM at another shop. And I think that's, I don't think that means being Sam Zell. I think that looks like believing in the asset class, having some personal aspirations to get into real estate. Are you personally interested in getting to real estate? If no, why are you trying to sell that to other people? Does that make sense to try to sell other people to get into an asset class that you don't have interest in being in personally? Um, those are some things that come to mind for me. Yeah, I agree with that. that like that is, I think when I started doing sales at Evernest, um, I connected immediately with investors because I owned investment property in Birmingham. So they were calling me saying, Hey, I'm, I've, I've got, you know, three properties in Birmingham. I'm like, Oh really? What streets? And I was able to talk to them about it. I knew the type of houses I knew the problems they had. I had empathy, like big time empathy with these people. And so it was just a very, very natural conversation. So yeah, I think that's a very, very valid point. Great point. Can I just add something here? I uh, we've, gone through a lot of techniques, but I, I think one of the the best ways to land business is just to pick up the phone when somebody calls. I uh, I am, uh, it's just amazing to me that we try to automate it and passively uh, sign up people. But um, a lot of times these, uh, these people that are calling want, think that their situation is specific and it may not be specific to us, but they don't really know our industry. And so when we pick up the phone and we can be in charge of of uh, framing the conversation so that, you know, in our case, Evernest is the best solution to their problem, then uh, we're going to win more doors than not. And I think a lot of times uh, BDMs get to the point where they're like, oh, I don't want to pick up the phone. You know, it's probably a resident or it's probably, you know, and those are the those are the ones that they miss. And I would rather, I mean, Jonathan said it, said it great in a text, you know, it's, it's better to have a 45 minute phone call because keep on people are calling when th this is not their day job and people are calling when they have time to do it. And so they're either calling on a lunch hour or before work or after work. And so if you can be the one to pick up the phone or your BDM can pick up the phone, they're going to land a lot of leads. And that's where Brad and I, when we first started the business, we were desperate for houses. So we would answer the phone if it was nine o'clock at night or Sunday afternoon, we would answer the phone and have a conversation. I can remember a bunch of times people would call me on a Saturday. The Saturday is the only time they have to, to basically solve this problem. I would ride out to go see a house on a Saturday and sign them up and have it listed, you know, on a Sunday. So BDMs need to be that, that type of aggressive. I got a story for you. I got a story for you on that, that the long phone call conversation with the speed to read. So um, the owner of all property management, if you haven't heard of it, go research it. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, APM does work if you pay the money. But my third APM lead, this was no kidding, 11, 12 years ago, uh, a gentleman named Mr. Mark Clayton. And he was my third lead. I got the lead. I pulled over to the side of the road. I was on the way you want a listing appointment or something else, put on the side of the road, immediately had called him and I managed 15 of his homes for over 10 years. So that, that lead cost me what, $65? What did that generate me over the lifetime value of managing him and those homes? So you cannot discount APM as a valid lead source because it is. But you gotta be the ones that are, are contacting. You gotta be the first call, right? How many times? Has anybody called an APM lead within minutes and they're talking to an owner and they're getting buzzed, right? They're getting other phone calls coming in from the person that you beat. I mean, it literally have a race to get them on the phone. So you have to be the first to call. You can't underestimate that, the speed lead concept. 